Um, right, so this is Ebony Davis Hayes, um, who I know from my time at Virginia Theological Seminary. Um, so I am using my BTS connection because I think Ebony is um, doing phenomenal work and is just a great speaker, and I'm excited to have her join us, even if virtually. Um, so Ebony is a public historian with a passion for sharing and preserving Black history. She holds an MA in Museum Studies and Historical Preservation from Morgan State University and is currently pursuing, and I think is really close to her PhD um, in African Diaspora History at Howard University. I think his dissertation is a social history on the memory of slavery and emancipation in postbellum Alexandria, Virginia, where the seminary is located. For over 15 years, Ebony has operated within the field of public history, working for local, state, and national institutions in the Americas and Africa. While holding jobs such as a historical interpreter, a cultural resource specialist, and an archivist, Ebony's work has afforded her the privilege of sharing documenting and preserving the stories of Black people exclusively. In 2017, Ebony began working at BTS as the processing archivist for the African American Episcopal Historical Collection. And in 2020, she transitioned to the Seminary's Office of Multicultural Ministries. And there she serves as the Associate for Programming and Historical Research for Reparations. So Ebony coordinates the research efforts of the BTS Reparations Program and works directly with the program's descendant families. So I'm thrilled to welcome her. And I think um, Ebony is going to have a presentation for 20 or 25 minutes or so, and then we'll have time for questions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. So yes, I, I have a, a brief presentation. It's probably more about 15 to 20 minutes, depending on how fast I talk. And I, I talk too fast, so I'm gonna try to slow down. Um, and then I'm going to share a short video. And then I would love for us to have some discussion. Hopefully the technology will allow us to do that um, based off of your previous forum hours and how it all kind of relates to what we're doing here with the reparations program. All right, um, give me one second. All right, so um, I work in the Office of Multicultural Ministries. I'm the associate for um, programming and historical research for reparations. In, in that role, I straddle the duties of managing our research team and serving the ever-growing base of descendants participating in our reparations program. In the last few years, reparations has become quite the hot topic, as I'm sure you all know, growing in national prominence as the United States is yet again confronted with the sins of its past and present. In many ways, Virginia Seminary has been an active participant in this conversation through the work of its reparations program. And as nations and institutions all over the world grapple with their involvement with the transatlantic slave trade, the institution of slavery, and overall force of white supremacy, the call for reparations, a call that has been echoed for centuries, grows louder and louder. In September of 2019, VTS announced the creation of a reparations endowment fund in the intent to research, uncover, and recognize African Americans who toiled under the under the oppression of the seminary during slavery throughout the eras of Reconstruction and Jim Crow. In February of 2021, VTS issued its first reparations payment to the descendants of John Samuel Thomas Jr., a Baptist minister, World War II veteran, and the former head janitor at Virginia Theological Seminary. Though only a few years old, the VTS Reparations Program has unearthed the names of hundreds of Black people, free and enslaved, who labored at the seminary. To date, over 100 of their descendants have received payments from the fund. These payments, while small and certainly inadequate, are the first step in our hopes of building a new relationship with the community long ignored and undervalued by the seminary. As one of the primary people working in this program, I can directly speak to the personal pride and rewards of doing this work. And while yes, this is the first program to ever pay cash reparations for slavery, it does not stand on its own. The work of our program is in line with a long 
and storied legacy of self-advocacy and determination in which Black people across the globe have asserted their right to call to task the nations and institutions who've oppressed and enslaved them. Those of you who follow the reparations debate might mark the early calls for reparations globally to the United Nations World Conference Against Racism, uh, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerance, which was held in Durban, South Africa back in 2001. Others of you might note the persistent work of the late Rep Representative John Conyers and his 1989 Congress congressional bill, H.R. 40, the Commission to Study and Develop Reparations Proposals for African Americans Act. These are indeed major acts in the call of reparations in recent history. But the truth is individual and collective calls for redress, restitution, and reparations in some form or another have been occurring in former slave societies like Cuba, Brazil, and the United States since the 18th century. As emancipation spread across the globe, there were countless individual calls for reparations recorded in slave narratives, judicial records, and pamphlets published in French, Portuguese, English, and Spanish. Unfortunately, collective calls for reparations and specific ones directed towards institutions and national governments were less frequent until the 20th century, as they were most likely inspired by the paying of restitution to Jewish victims of the Holocaust and Japanese Americans unlawfully interred during World War II. Those collective calls, however, were and still are coming from people across the African diaspora and run the gamut in form from full-on revolution to political lobbying and intercontinental coalition building. So what exactly is this tradition of reparations work that we find ourselves operating in today? What does reparations look like in the here and now? Well, what re reparations as we understand it and use the word today typically takes on a combination of two separate definitions, one historical and the other contemporary. Historically, the term has been used to simply convey the idea of making amends for a past wrongdoing. Reparations to repair. Contemporarily, the term is the redress of physical, material, or moral damage inflicted on an individual or group. Essentially, reparations in today's context is the act of attempting to make right a grievous wrong by way of material or moral recompense. As such, it is the goal of the VTS reparations program to acknowledge both the moral and material transgressions of the seminary's participation in slavery and segregation, not to reconcile or even to repair, but to begin anew. As we go about the slow and intentional work of building relationships with our descended community, we are listening and learning a lot. To say that this is not an easy task would be a vast understatement. This work is hard. It's full of complexities and requires an incredible amount of emotional labor, but it is necessary. And more importantly, we know that it's possible. So now I would like to walk you through some of the particularities of our program and how it's actually implemented. Because when I, when I say we are the first and likely only institution paying cash reparations, um, there's a weight to that um, that is it's hard to put into words. And so um, in developing our program, um, we're grateful for Dr. Joe Thompson, who is the um, Dean of the Office of Multicultural Ministries, who, who kind of, is, this is his brainchild. And um, I'm gonna walk you through what our implementation looks like, if that is okay. Um, so where we are, our impl implementation effort is tasked with the administration of the program. And that includes fostering relationships with the des descendants' families to assess their needs and connect with the desires that they have for their beneficiaries, manage managing the seminary's commitment to the other aspects of the program. So addition, in addition to paying reparations to descendant families, we also have grants for historically black congregations and um, black alumni from the seminary. So that's an, an additional side that we manage. And then um, 
always doing an overhaul and determination of the best practices of our programs policies. Because again, like I said, there is no blueprint for this. We are the first. So we are always sitting down and, and reviewing how, how's it going, what's working, what's not working. Um, so in essence, at this stage of our program, we're doing three things. The research and identification of individuals for the purposes of making annual cash payments to the direct descendants of Black people who worked here, who were enslaved at the seminary between the uh, between its founding in 1823 and its integration in 1951. We refer to those individuals as our shareholders. And that means that if you are the direct descendant of anyone who labored here during those years, you are eligible to receive rep reparations. And our reparations payments are made annually. So once a year, every year, forever, you get a payment from the seminary. And then we set up an agreement letter where you leave it to your beneficiaries. And that can be a creative process where you just leave it to your child and their, their child and so on and so forth. Um, we've had people pool their money together and set up a scholarship fund. We've had people donate it to um, local HBCUs. There are a number of different ways that people can engage with their share of the fund and um, pass it on to future generations. And we also, <laughs> excuse me, um, host a annual event to honor our descendants. And that's the video I'll play shortly. Each year it has grown and grown and grown. As I mentioned, our we've made over a hundred payments and our descendant group is somewhere upwards of 400 people. Um, from the family trees that we put together, it's about 530 something people, but a number of them are deceased. So living people, we're, we're looking at about 400 or so. Um, and so each year, the descendants who are already onboarded into the program get a payment once a year, every year. Um, and we have seen that that has been a perfect entry point for us to engage in relationships with the descendants. The money is not everything, um, but it is certainly a central part. Um, and we we're very grateful to be able to engage with them like that and open the door. And we ask that um, we don't ask anything of the descendants, but we reach out our hand and hope that in, in they will return and grab our hand back and walk in us together as we build a relationship. Um, so typically I either end or begin um, my talks with reading through the names of the ancestors that were once either enslaved at the seminary or worked here under Jim Crow. But that name, that list of names has gotten so long, it's five pages long. And so now I don't do that. But my purpose in doing that is number one to all, I believe in calling out our, calling our ancestors names and remembering them. And also specifically calling their names in this place where if their name was ever called, number one, it certainly wasn't called with reverence. And so because that list is so long, it would take me about 20 minutes alone to read it. I'm gonna play a short video from the Descendant Gala that we had in 2022. We are preparing to have our next one this July. Um, to give you an idea of the the um, the spirit of the program that can't quite be put into words, but you have to witness and just be a part of um, for yourself. So I'm going to share my screen. And then once this is done, I would love to, to have some discussion. <clears throat> Millie, Sophie, Julia Parker, Carter Dowling, Harriet Stewart McKnight Shorts, Burr Shorts, Joseph Terrell, Philip Terrell, Henrietta Henny Tate, William Tate, Matilda Dixon, Nathan Dixon, Albert Fortune, Wallace Wanzer, Elizabeth York, Ann Curtis, William Russell, Lewis Washington, Bernie Bunny McKnight, 
Pleasant Green. John Peters Sr. John Peters Jr. Jacob E. Terrell. Cora Lena Terrell. Rebecca Terrell. Norman Roy Sr. Leon Strange. Robert Archie Strange. John Samuel Thomas Jr. Charles Wanzer III. Emonia E. Lewis. Joseph Wanzer. Fanny Sims Wanzer. Daniel Wanzer. Llewellyn Wanzer. Joseph Wanzer Jr. Daniel G. Sims. Wilmer B. Henry. Willie Mae Carter Henry. John Wesley Casey Sr. George H. Casey. Charles Casey. Ada Virginia Casey. John Wesley Casey Jr. Herbert Casey. To the families of those named and unnamed, I am humbled and honored that you have agreed to journey with BTS in this process. The labor of your ancestors and the communities they created were crucial to the establishment and growth of Virginia Theological Seminary. It is their legacy that we hope to acknowledge and honor with this work. And we have you to thank for making it all possible. All right. Um, so I know I gave you just a very like quick and dirty overview of the program. Um, I would love to answer questions and and do more to help maybe bring this information into context, particularly with what you've already been discussing with your forum hours. So I hand it over to you, Winnie. Cool. Um, well, so again, our forums for a couple of weeks have focused on repentance, not so much as um, exclusively looking back and trying to make amends, but also moving forward and turning. That's really the meaning of repent in a Christian setting. And so I appreciate, Ebony, that you sort of said that explicitly. Like, yes, part of this is looking backwards. Um, at what was done and how people were treated and making amends for that, but also how can we partner and move forward. Um, so I'm wondering if you can share a little bit more about um, the, the other details. I know you sort of listed what else is happening, but the payments to, uh, the grants to some um, historically black congregations, um, some of the outreach being done to recruit stu more students of color, I think that might be a part of what's being done. Um, I wonder if you can share some of that. Sure. So, um, yes, we have grants that, and I, at this point, I, I do not know how many grants we've issued. Um, it was, at last I checked, seven or eight um, to either Black alumni from the seminary or historically Black congregations that are, um, typically there's an alumni there working there, um, but there have been other independent congregations that have reached out um, within the Episcopal Church. We also are partnering with Mead Memorial Episcopal Church, which is a historically Black um, congregation here in Alexandria, and Oakland Baptist Church, which is a historic church just up the street from the seminary. And the connection with Oakland Baptist is that the Black individuals that labored here at the seminary um, during their downtime or their, their lunch breaks, if you will, would go and literally build Oakland Baptist Church. So while working here, they were spending their, their free time building their home church, which is the home church of several of our descendants. Um, and they still are members there, or even if they have moved away, they're still very quite connected there um, and have some ancestors that are buried in the, the church seminary there. So it is a very relevant congregation to the community and very relevant congregation to our descendant community um, and we're neighbors. So it made sense that as part of the program, with additional funds that we have, we could offer some kind of um, amount to them and work with them to to see what how we could best meet certain needs. And the same thing with um, Meet Memorial Episcopal Church. 
Where does the funding come from? Um, Say that again. Where does the funding come from? Um, the dean has a discretionary fund. Um, it was designated I believe in 2018 or 2019 and he pushed it to put it towards the reparations program so it was a very easy process for us in most institutions you have individuals who are working to convince their administration convince the uh, convince the institution that this is a necessary cause and it worked in the opposite direction for us our institution from the top said we want to designate these funds because we feel this is important and so initially the fund was $1.7 million. It's now, I believe, $2.8 million. And we take um, the yield from that every year from the market and divide it amongst the number of shareholders in the program. And that's how we make the annual payments each year, in addition to onboarding new descendants every year as well. So there's a, a two-part happening. Um, but the money came from the, the Dean's Discretionary Fund. And we should just note, UTS is um, uniquely financially situated compared to a lot of seminaries. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's a school that has a ton of money um, and so like a huge endowment, which um, a lot of students have some problems with, but it also has allowed students to attend for free, for example, and for this program. So I think we recognize we're in a privileged position as an institution way Absolutely. beyond any other seminary. So. Absolutely. Um, I think one of the things from the video you showed is the wonderful sense of community that's also coming out of this. I would think in many ways, the people that are coming together with this program just seem wonderful. But I was wondering how you actually found the people. I mean, it's such a challenge. I'm on the board of an institution that was founded in the 1770s, and I know we <laughs> could do a program like this, but I'm not sure where we would start and how we would start. And if you could supply a model of um, how other institutions can do this, I mean, just some, in some general way, it would be great because I think it's fabulous what you're doing. Um, absolutely. So for, to your first point, I will say that this community was very much together and, and connected long before the seminary came to them and said, we have this program. Um, and that also helps to answer your, your second question. The Black Alexandria is still very much here. It's a very vibrant community that is uh, surrounds the seminary. Um, and so once you talk to one person, you've, you, it spreads and you're talking to all of them. And so this was a very well-connected and, and, and um, like strong community that knew their history. So when, when our researchers were coming to them, we weren't giving them any new information. We might've been filling in some blanks in their family trees or filling in some blanks with some stories and maybe dates or two, but they knew they know the people they come from. Um, and so that is, that's been a blessing for us. And while the seminary did not start, there's some institutions that have like, you know, a list of people who were enslaved at their, their institution. We did not have that, but we did have the benefit of living history and, and I mean, oral history, excuse me, and living memory because of the community is still here, even though many of them have moved on, they're still very connected here. They know the stories, they know their ancestors, and they were able to help us piece together the missing parts of the seminary story that the, that the seminary never wanted to tell. And so the first step I would say for institutions looking to begin this work, you need a genealogist who knows how to work in the records. Um, if you don't have your own record or listing of who was enslaved, even um, just first name, then it, you are really going to have to do a lot of digging before you can even find um, names, let alone dis living descendants. And I will say the majority of our descendant population is from the Jim Crow era. Um, we have many of them within that who are also connected to enslavement because we have generations of people in one family working here, like multiple people worked here. If if the mother was hired in the laundry, then her niece got a job here and then her daughter got a, got a job here and then her brother worked uh, on the farm. Like there were generations of individuals in multiple families that worked here. And so it's kind of like once you pull one thread, it starts to unravel for you. But when you're beginning during the period of enslavement, 
and you do not have a ledger with names, you really have to have a genealogist who's very familiar with the archive and, and, and knowing how to uncover things that are right there often hidden in plain sight. Um, but I would argue that almost every institution that's that old, if they still have an archive and have some kind of records, they have a ledger with labor in it. Um, even the seminary, although we said we didn't, as we have been researching even more recently, we're finding ledgers with like, with names. Um, and so this these lists that we thought we didn't have in the beginning, we now know that we've had, and they've been right here, right in our archives. Thank you. Some of which was just answered. But um, are you encouraged to moving forward by your work at BTS, encouraging other seminaries and other just individual organizations of your work and moving forward, embracing it and, and doing it? I mean, are you, because what you're doing is teaching other people and organizations about the work. Are you seeing other people take this? We are seeing other people um, have the desire to do this work and um, we are seeing other people do this in the way that the <laughs> their institution will allow them. Like I said, we really have the benefit of this being mandated from the top. Um, there are many people, like I said, for forever who have been fighting and fighting and trying to convince those in power that this is a necessary cause and that this is where money should be put into. Um, so a lot of the work we do with other institutions or other individuals at institutions um, is, is, is navigating ways to have symbolic reparations, um, to um, create spaces for tough and challenging conversations where maybe some healing can be birthed out of that. Um, ways that we have learned with working with descendants, navigating different emotional traumas, um, all of the things that we're learning as working with descendants. But um, I will say it is, it is a little difficult for me. Um, and I think I can speak for Joe to say the same, to talk to people who are like beating against a brick wall that um, where their their leadership is just not really for this. So they're they're trying find, trying to find ways to engage in this work in different ways. We really do have the privilege of just not having that barrier. Um, and I, I recognize that that makes our work, even though this work is so hard, it does make it a lot easier because we're not fighting on both ends. Um, I have a question. I'm involved in some uh, lineage-based organizations. Can you hear me all right? A little, um, it's a little echoey, but let's keep trying. <laughs> uh, and one of the questions is, uh, with the advent of DNA testing and uh, and people able to, to pinpoint some of the geographic um, areas from which they originate, is there part of the narrative which explores the country countries that the enslaved people came from and the cultures within those countries from which uh, their families originate. Is there part of the narrative that explores the countries where people came from? And yeah. the last part I didn't hear. Um, yeah, just that he was talking about the DNA testing and the, the ability we have to learn a lot more. Is that part of what's being learned about the descendants? No. Um, so there are some descendants who have done their DNA research and all of that and have their own um, profiles on ancestry. Like, like I said, they, we, we, they're they very knowledgeable and know, know where they come from, but that is not a part of this program. We aren't requiring anyone to prove that they are. Like a lot of them come when they sit and meet with me to do their onboarding. They're like, I have my ID and myself. We're, they, this is about building relationships and building trust. So we're not... um. We're not trying to uh, make anyone feel like this is a, like a clinical type of process. Um, and so I'm assuming you're asking like in terms of responsibility with nations that participated in the slave trade? Actually not. The idea is that uh, uh, say within the world, there are 194 approximately countries and, um, and each of those countries have sent immigrants to America bringing their own individual cultures. And this would be true from the communities that came from um, Africa, for example, 
but there are different cult there are different cultures within those different communities. And I just wondered whether that was part of the narrative that you were exploring. Not as a not, not as, as a part community. of the process, sort of as to verify, but just out of um, people are excited. Curiosity. People are excited about who their ancestors are and what they did. Not from a qualitative standpoint, but simply because it, you know it's, it's part of their their being. Right. But it so, sounds like like are we offering support for people to to learn that part of their history? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um that is not off the table. And I say that because um in addition to the annual payment, there is kind of a an open door for different descendants to come to the seminary with special requests. Um to help them support a number of different things. So specifically like need requests. So we've had people come who are housing insecure and we've connected them with people who could help them find more affordable and secure housing. Um, we've done other things more recently. Um, one of the descendants, her son was stationed in Bahrain and received an award and we flew her out there so she could be present and surprise him as he was pinned and all of that. Um, and so I say that to say there are special requests where people come to us. So if someone came and said, hey, you know, I want to do my DNA research. I want to trace my my lineage back to where I, whatever um, group we were from in Africa. Could you help support me with that? Could you connect me to a genealogist or could you even pay for my uh, DNA kit? That would be something that the seminary probably could do. So, um, yes, is probably the short answer. <laughs> Questions? I'm just, I'm just like the financial thing. Like, so it sounds like you don't. Do you promise that the particular person will get the same amount of money every year, or is it just like you'll get something every year? No, it's you'll get something every year. If I can, um, I can share my screen and kind of give you all a breakdown of a sample family tree, so you can. Yeah. It's it is it is a complex process, but um, I can. Break you through with the break it down with a visual if that would be helpful. Give me one okay. second, I can pull it up. Um, but it is not the same amount every year. Okay. Um, sorry, it's not sharing. Let me. It might be because of how this PowerPoint is. Um, let me just pull it up in a Word document one second. Okay, let's try again. Are you able to see? Yes. Should I make it bigger? A little bit, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's smaller. Okay. All right, so this this is our sample family tree that we use. So with our program, the descendant that is closest to the ancestor that worked at the seminary is the one who the one or ones who are considered our shareholders and receive payment. And so in this family, Eliza worked at the seminary, and 
what our research would do is we would drop down every generation until we get to a living member. So Eliza worked here. Her two children are deceased. So then we drop down to her grandchildren where at least one of them is living. Um, her grandchildren are Keith, Francis, and Joanna. And these would be our shareholders. This is our shareholder generation for Elijah Jackson's family. And so that means each one of her three children get a share. Um, and because Keith is deceased, his share gets divided amongst his three children. Now I'm gonna scroll up so we can look at some numbers. Um, here's our endowment. This year we um, have $2.7 million. The yield was 98,000. Um, and the dean designated an additional 25,000 to that fund to make the share an even $525 to the shareholders. Um, depending on who you are, you get a little bit more, a lot of bit more, a little bit less, or a lot of bit less because it's based on the family, who you're dividing it with, where you fall in that shareholder generation or not. Um, this number right here is the number of shareholders. So we divide this number, the yield, by this number, the shareholders, and we get to the share. Does that help a little bit? Yeah, very helpful. So the shareholders are current, this alive current descendants. One more time. Instead of like the number of people that originally worked there, the, the shareholders are the are people who are alive. Yes. Today. Yes, so it, we drop down to the descendant, the living descendants of the the um the individual that labored here at the seminary, and there are our, our reasoning for determining it that way. Um, because of course there could be an argument made that the oldest person living in the family, or so on and so forth. We felt that this was the most equitable way to um to capture the living descendants. So even if someone, when we did our research, we found. Um, someone who was living in there, they were like 98 years old. And then by the time we actually onboarded them to the program, they deceased, they still count as a shareholder and their share still gets to go to their children and then gets divided and then so on and so forth. So every year they do get something that, that something does change. And I will be very honest with you that something gets smaller and smaller every year because the more we research, the more we find people. We initially started out with 32 shareholders and the share for each one of them was $2,100. And now our number is 236. And I think it's 237 now because we just found someone else. Um, and the share is $525. Now, again, like I said, depending on who you are and where you fall in the family and if you have to divide your share or if you are receiving additional shares from people who are deceased and have no heirs, you could get more or less. But the share stays the same for that fiscal year. Every year is different though. But you've been successful in doing some fundraising for, for yeah. Um, successful is relative. Um, have we raised funds? Yes. Is it enough to make a difference? No. But there are people, I mean, when the program was announced, there were people who doubled their pledge. There were people who took away their pledge. Um, there were people who heard that people took away their pledge and made pledges for the first time. So um, overwhelmingly, this program is supported by donors, um, but we need more. And um, that's a call to, to people who feel led to do this work and maybe are at an institution that won't allow them. But that's also a call to our, our institution and our leadership to put more towards this fund, because as Winnie said, they have it. And I will just say, as um, so I started at BCS in August of 2019, and this uh, this was announced in September, and it was like, it, it felt like Christmas at seminary. Like we couldn't believe what had just been announced for news agencies reporting on this. And we just, um, it felt like, wow, finally somebody is doing something to actually mark the wrong that, has done, that was done. And again, not just look backwards, but look forwards. And the student body, again, it's anecdotal, like the student body has, I think become a little bit more diverse. In oh, absolutely. I would, I would, I yeah. I, I've been at the seminary almost seven years, I believe. Um, 
And it's a completely different thing. Like even in the Office of Multicultural Ministries, there are initiatives that we had early on that I just don't feel are necessary. Like we're we're trying to have these conversations or trying to create a task force. And it's like this work, this particular work isn't needed now. Like we we have an evolution of thought and diversity here that now we can actually, instead of trying to help people along and change, we now can, uh, we now are empowering the seminarians to be change agents when they leave and they go out into their own congregations. So it has been um, a nice journey to see the work of this office particular really permeate throughout the seminary and um, I think empower people to really go out and, and, and feel like they can actually make some change. Absolutely. Any more questions? We're about at thank you. just after 11.30. So, I mean, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Everybody really appreciated hearing from you. Thank you so much. And I'll follow up with a note for you. I just have one more question to ask, but thank okay. you so much. Absolutely. All right. You all have a great day. Fabulous. 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 Fabul